Thank you for joining us for the sixth in our series of seven virtual lectures this fall. Our final talk this fall will take place on December 1st and will feature Professor Jeremy Bendit Kamer with a talk titled, To Be Held and To Be Seen, Love's Moral Core and the Security of Wondering. For information on this and all of our upcoming events, please visit our website at bakernord.case.edu. It's my pleasure now to introduce today's speaker, Professor Tony Jack. Professor Jack leads the Brain, Mind, and Consciousness Lab at CWRU, where his primary affiliation is as an associate professor in the Department of Philosophy, as well as having secondary appointments in the departments of psychology, neurology, neurosciences, and organizational behavior. Professor Jack is also the research director of the Inamori International Center for Ethics and Excellence. His talk today is, This is Your Brain on Humanity. Professor Jack. Thank you. Uh, we live in unusual times. And I don't just mean this week. We're supposed to have been living in the information age for more than 50 years now. That may be, but we clearly entered a qualitatively new realm of it in the last decade. These things are a long way from our chief source of information being the sharing of stories around the fire at night. They say knowledge is power, and it's also be said that the essence of democracy is the decentralization of power. So the last decade has been a democratic utopia, right? For a moment, it did look like that. Do you remember the hope of the Arab Spring? That was less than 10 years ago. So much has happened. The conversion from utopia to dystopia has proved as rapid as the pace of everything these days. Here is my favorite comic on the subject. I should probably be ashamed to take any delight at the situation we have suffered through, but I can't help it. I'm an optimist by nature. I can't help but feel like this era of sociopathic leadership and fake news will, at least eventually, cause us all to be better attuned to concepts that we usually take for granted. Specifically, I mean the ideas of truth and empathy. Ever since I caught the bug as an undergraduate studying psychology and philosophy, now more than a quarter century ago, my efforts have focused on interdisciplinary research at the intersection of philosophy and the sciences of the mind. My work in brain imaging has forced me to recognize the central importance of empathy. My philosophical musings have increasingly become preoccupied with the nature of knowledge. While I would hesitate to say we can learn from the 45th president, I can still see a silver lining. Information is now so abundant. Misinformation, yes, but also more high quality information than ever before. The problem is not the information. The problem is how we process it. It is now commonplace to claim that humans are irrational. The Nobel Prize winning work of Kahneman and Tversky demonstrated our profound tendency to rely on heuristics and biases to make decisions in everyday life. Even expert statisticians often make these mistakes, which they only overcome with considerable cognitive effort. This highly influential line of thought has been popularized by another Israeli import to the US, the prolific and charismatic Dan Ariely who characterizes us as predictably irrational. It is tempting to think the way politics has developed over the last decade is the proof in the pudding. Certainly the relationship between education level and voting tendency tells us something important, but I don't think this line of thinking is quite right. I don't think we humans are so irrational. I think the problem isn't so much our capacity for reason but rather the way we have been thinking about and trying to shape that faculty. Human reason itself isn't nearly so biased as our beliefs about human reason have become. As the information age has taken hold, we have increasingly gotten the emphasis wrong. We need to fix that fast or we're if we're going to reach our potential. Philosophy thrives on metaphors, particularly when it comes to trying to describe something as abstract as the nature of knowledge. Trees of knowledge are a recurring theme found as far back as the 9th century BC. Descartes was a foundationalist, hoping to ground the edifice of human knowledge on solid bedrock. 
Quine had his web of belief, emphasizing the interconnectedness and the elements of the elements and the need to anchor the outer ends in experience. Two metaphors which recent events have brought very much to the fore are filter bubbles and echo chambers. Although these are partly self-explanatory, there is more nuance and richness to these metaphors than might at first appear. I strongly recommend a marvelous talk from the Royal Institute of Philosophy by the philosopher Si Tai Gwen, which I mispronounced, I'm sure I apologize, which has some overlap with the themes I will discuss here. Of course, you can find it instantly on YouTube. The central metaphor I want to focus on today is a little different. It is that of the epistemic lens. This metaphor first lodged itself in my mind when, as an undergraduate in a philosophy of science course, I read Thomas Kuhn's 1962, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. This book remains one of the most cited academic books of all time, and it isn't surprising, it's at time really quite poetic. It describes how different scientific approaches, paradigms in Kuhn's terminology, encourage us to see the world in such fundamentally different ways that it's often difficult perhaps at times impossible, to directly compare one theory with another. Kuhn said they were incommensurable. One reason why I like the lens metaphor is because of the obvious point that without a lens to bring things into focus, we would not be able to see anything at all. Of course, to actually see, we humans need much more than a lens. We also need a brain. There are some unfortunate people who have cataracts at birth, which are only surgically corrected later in life. At first, such individuals are incapable of making sense of their new visual inputs. It takes time for them to integrate the visual world with the world they already know through touch. Our brains need a model of the world to decode it, a model which gets built up apart from experience. The visual illusions you experience looking at this slide are forced upon you by the assumptions your visual system has, come from, has gained from familiarity with different things. The first one is obviously from written language. The second, from how the sun tends to cast shadows. The third, surprisingly, is from living in a world of rectilinear buildings. And the fourth is the implausibility of coming across a Pac-Man figure outside the context of a video game. Our naive epistemology of vision is that of direct perception, the idea that our mental image directly corresponds to the world without any need to rely on inference. But that idea just doesn't hold up to scrutiny. These days, neuroscientists and philosophers hold to the theory of predictive coding, the idea that the brain is constantly generating and updating a mental model of the environment. In other words, perception can be thought of as guided hallucination. Reason is in even worse shape. It is less informationally rich and obviously more reliant on inference. The further we get from perception, the more we must rely on assumptions to get any kind of coherent body of knowledge off the ground. This point has not always been appreciated. John Locke's radical empiricist notion of the newborn's mind as white paper or a blank slate has proved quite influential. The great Swiss developmental psychologist, Jean Piaget, had the captivating idea that each child can be thought of as being like a little Kuhnian scientist undergoing one revolution after another. In other words, they come up with novel theories or schema of the world as they progress through development. Piaget came up with a clever experiment which seemed to demonstrate that children initially don't understand that objects exist outside of their immediate perception until they make a paradigm shift to the concept of object permanence at around eight months old. According to Piaget, subsequent developmental stages involved grasping concepts of number, and eventually, not until 11 or 12 years old, the ability to think in hypothetical terms and the concept of moral justice. Later researchers working in essentially the same paradigm would interpret the Sally Ann task as showing that children don't truly grasp the concept of other minds until somewhere between three and five years old, typically, and later, or maybe even never, if they suffer from autism spectrum disorder. Piaget's idea of the child seeing the world through a whole new set of lenses as they develop is very poetic. However, it isn't really accurate. William James was closer to the mark when he described the mental experience of the newborn infant as a blooming, buzzing confusion. 
Piaget was assuming a rather more coherent worldview than the infant's brain can muster. The apparent support for Piaget's poetic idea of radical shifts in perspective was in fact an artifact of the experimental procedures, the paradigm he used. Piaget assumed that the, world, the child's manual actions directly reflected their understanding of the world. However, one of the main things that develops in infancy is the child's control of action, as much, just as much as their understanding of the world. Researchers get quite a different picture of what infants understand when they track their gaze, and particularly when they pay attention to what they find surprising. This yields a quite different picture. It isn't that infants build from a single foundation, slowly getting to more complex social concepts. On the contrary, perhaps the majority of the infant's most foundational schemas for understanding and acting in the world are social in nature. They imitate gestures, of, often with obvious pleasure, from birth, and they are bereft when they experience an interruption in the back of thought forth of expressions and reactions with their primary caregiver. There is even evidence that infants understand people to be so fundamentally different from physical objects, they aren't surprised when people fail to, to obey physical laws. No wonder we find it so easy to believe in ghosts or life after death as adults. In his book, Descartes' Baby, the developmental psychologist Paul Bloom summarizes development by saying, although babies enter the world with a foundational understanding of what objects are and how they act, it is incomplete and this foundation grows. It isn't just that Locke and Piaget's radical empiricist vision of the infant's brain turned out to be false. It had to be false. As a long line of philosophers from Immanuel Kant to Richard Rorty have pointed out, our minds simply aren't capable of directly mirroring nature. Indeed, many physicists also acknowledge this, despite dedicating their lives to doing the best they can. We can't know the world for what it really is. All we can really know is the sense we can make of it. Obviously, that can get us a very long way, but our brains need to prime the pump with hallucinations just to get the engine of understanding started. As a result, we can never quite be sure which part of that understanding is true reality and which part our construction. This is a typical brain in action. This person hasn't even even been given anything to do. They're just lying in a tightly enclosed space of the scanner with nothing much to look at and only the numbing drone of the machine to listen to. Yet the brain keeps working, constantly trying to make sense of what it can, constantly making up stories, constantly inventing its reality. Maybe, right at this moment, this person is thinking about what to eat for dinner. The human brain is remarkably flexible, or plastic as neuroscientists like to say, especially when we are young. When you stop to compare humans to other species, it is truly remarkable the variety of things we are capable of learning. It is worth bearing in mind that many, perhaps even most of the things we do each day are completely foreign to us from an evolutionary point of view. Reading, typing, calculating costs, driving, doom scrolling on our cell phones. We can get our brains to do all sorts of things, and it can adapt to all sorts of changes. The primary visual cortex of most humans and most mammals is completely dedicated to visual processing. But in those who are born blind, it doesn't go to waste. It still gets used. However, the brain isn't completely flexible. It is a very long way from being equipotential, such that any part of it can do whatever is wanted. A great deal of neural structure is determined by our genes, including the major connections between brain regions and also the way the local circuitry is organized in different regions. We know this varies across the cortex. Some of the more obvious and coarse transitions in local computational architecture were charted through careful observation of post-mortem brains more than 100 years ago. Because our neural structure is laid down by our genes, we see a remarkable degree of consistency in what brain areas different people use to do the same task, even though they have learnt the skill in different ways. Obviously, the primary visual cortex of people with congenital blindness can't process visual information, but it actually does a very similar job, processing tactile information that gets rerouted from the hands helping those born blind to recognize the bumps of braille letters better than those with visual cortices that process vision ever can. 
Although there is remarkable flexibility in what the brain can learn to do, there is also remarkable consistency. There is no doubt that culture, upbringing, personal experience, and education all play huge roles in how we construct our understanding of the world. Having spent much of my life struggling to become more fluid at switching between the paradigms of psychology, neuroscience, and philosophy, I would be inclined to say that education plays the biggest role. However, it's clear that our biology also plays a role. It makes a difference which parts of the brain you use to make sense of whatever aspect of the world you're currently trying to understand. Different parts of the brain have been designed by evolution to come at things rather differently. Hence, our conceptual schemes can be built with different combinations and emphases, and to some degree with different foundational assumptions. So in summary, there is good reason to think that understanding the structure of the human brain should tell us something fundamental about the structure of human knowledge. Now by this, I don't mean how human knowledge happens to be structured right now. If we want to know that, I, I guess we might go about it by starting to interview representatives from each department of the university, or perhaps examining the web of citations across disciplines. Here is a map for the sciences. You can see the expected gradient from hard to soft science runs from right to left. I couldn't find a map that also includes the humanities. Maybe that tells us something. Such maps, much like departments in the university, do presumably reflect something of how ideas are bound to fit together. They also reflect accidents of history. For the sake of keeping up my favorite metaphor, this map isn't so much a model of the true structure of human knowledge as it is a guided hallucination seen through the particular lens of Western intellectual culture. The brain offers us a rather different window, a window which might we might characterize as illuminating the contours of the landscape upon which knowledge can be built. So what does that landscape look like? Before I say more about that, a slight digression is necessary. How can we even know what the landscape looks like, what the structure of the brain is? Something as complex as the brain isn't easy to understand, and there are many stories to tell about this, stories which have occupied my professional life. Again, these are stories that are very much about different lenses. I have many such stories to tell. For instance, my first fascination was with psychology's transition from introspectionism to behaviorism. My most recent interest has, of course, been with brain imaging and its fitful attempts to integrate itself with everything from monkey electrophysiology to social psychology. These stories would add richness to the narrative and also allow me to thrash the metaphor of the lens nearly to death. However, this is a talk, not a book. This is a humanities audience, and we need to get to why it matters. So instead of the full story, I'm going to give you a cartoon version. To give you the gist of the story in advance, it does turn out that there's a very major division in the mind, but it isn't the division that most people assume. Current culture gives us a very distorted picture of the mind. I want you to get rid of that faulty, implicit model of the mind and replace it with some approximation of the actual truth. The faulty model which I'm talking about is the idea that the principal division in our minds is between reason and emotion, or if you're a little more old-fashioned, reason and passion. A further element of the story is that reason is generally understood to be superior, whereas emotion or passion lead us astray. This idea, of course, has a very long history. Many philosophers have distinguished between reason and passion, and most of them have been clear they view reason as superior. A lot of work in psychology has also operated with this assumption. Daniel Kahneman is the psychologist who helped found behavioral economics that I mentioned at the start. He and many other psychologists identify emotional thinking with irrational decisions. However, there is a problem with this view, which is often exemplified by this fellow. Phineas Gage was working out west in the middle of the 19th century. Known as a responsible, reliable, and intelligent married man, he was the foreman of a crew responsible for blasting away rocks to make a path for the railway. The rod you can see is a tamping iron. The charge went off early while he was tamping it, leaving him without the use of one eye and with considerable damage to his medial frontal cortex. Remarkably for the time, he survived, 
He also maintained much of his technical intelligence and understanding. However, his life soon fell apart. He took to gambling and womanizing, losing both his job and his wife, dying ultimately penniless and alone. Through some clever experiments and by studying a group of patients with similar brain injuries to Phineas Gage, Antonio and Hannah Damasio have been able to establish that emotion and reason are not so separate as we often imagine. They focused on practical decisions, decisions about what is the best thing to do under uncertainty and how to deal with other people. Practical decisions are, of course, most of the decisions that we make in life that actually matter, quite different from the decisions we must make to do well on intellectual tests. For such practical decisions, the Damasios have shown that reason, emotion, and the body are closely intertwined. In short, their work strongly supports the importance of trusting your gut, at least as long as your gut instincts are driven by a highly functioning ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Later researchers have extended the Damasio's work, showing the same brain areas play a key role in integrating cognition and emotion to generate what has been called effective meaning. This includes thinking about our own life story, reflecting on past life events and imagining how things will go in the future, moral judgments, the values we associate with objects, and our sense of purpose in life. So, if the major division in the brain isn't between emotion and reason, if psychology got that wrong, then what is it? The best evidence for a division in the mind actually comes from a branch of neuroscience that is about as far from psychology as you can get, network neuroscience. This brings us back to our beautiful flickering brain, which is constantly changing despite the absence of any psychological task. Network neuroscientists look for patterns in the spontaneous brain activity. There are two major types of pattern. The first is to look for brain regions that tend to go together, and that's called functional integration. In this way, scientists have been able to identify seven major networks in the human brain, simplifying the general picture. We know these networks of brain regions really do get work together because we see close physical connections between them, and they have been shown to work together during a number of different psychological tasks. The second type of pattern is brain regions that don't go together. This is called functional segregation. It turns out that there is just one major division of this type in the human brain, although there are also many smaller ones. There are two networks where when one tends to be active, the other tends to turn off. You can see this anti-correlated relationship in the graph. When the blue network is active, the red and yellow lines, which correspond to the other network, are suppressed and vice versa. These networks lie as far apart as e from each other as they can in network space. They have no direct connections, and the way in which they toggle off and on between each other has been likened to a seesaw. This seesaw pattern of brain activity is found to be a key signature of mental health. One of the most consistent signatures found by brain imaging of psychiatric disorder, or extreme fatigue also affects it, is a disruption in the seesaw relationship. The brain wants to keep these networks apart for a good reason. Lots of evidence show they tend to interfere with each other. But it isn't just that these networks need to toggle off from one another. It's also a key index of health that we keep moving through the entire breadth of mental space, that we continuously oscillate between both extremes. In fact, when the seesaw gets pushed one way by a task, there's a natural tendency for it to rebound afterwards. So what do these two networks do? Each of them contains a lot of cortex, so they do a whole family of different things. But there's a broad pattern to them. I refer to them as analytic and empathic networks. The analytic network has evolved from brain areas involved in perception and control of action. It's the network we use for challenging visual search tasks, to manipulate objects with our hands, and also to solve all manner of logical, mathematical, and scientific problems. This network has been called the network for general reasoning and underlies our analytic intelligence. It does what Immanuel Kant called theoretical reason. The empathic network, by contrast, has evolved from brain areas involved in bodily self-awareness and self-regulation, as well as the areas for effective meaning I mentioned earlier. 
It is the network we use for social cognition, including thinking about ourselves as well as others. It is the network we use for social, moral, and aesthetic reasoning. It is what Immanuel Kant called practical reason. What we have found is that we think, when we think about scientific puzzles, we push the seesaw to one extreme, activating the analytic network and turning off the empathic network. In contrast, when we pause to understand someone else's perspective on the world, then we activate the empathic network and suppress the analytic network. So it turns out the major division in the brain isn't between reason and passion. It's between two types of reason. The analytic network champions rationality. It likes facts, rules, and analytic schemes, and it loves a good argument. The empathic network likes to be reasonable. It considers different perspective, works with embodied metaphors, and engages in genuine dialogue. Empathic reason works with emotions, which are situated in subcortical areas. It's influenced by emotion, but it isn't driven by passion, quite the reverse. It is the network we need to beef up to keep ourselves emotionally regulated. This function of the empathic network is the other near universal signature of mental disorder. The analytic network, by contrast, can't talk to emotion. It can only suppress it or get hijacked by it. So it turns out that Descartes was half right after all, and the Damasios half wrong. <clears throat> I find it helpful to think of these two extremes, when the neural seesaw has gone one way, or the way, or the other, as the poles of reason. The two poles give us fundamentally different perspectives on the world, perspectives which have such a different basis they are often incompatible, or as Kuhn would say, incommensurable. Just like the duck rabbit, or another ambiguous figure, you can see it as a duck, or you can see it as a rabbit, but you can't see it both ways at the same time. Analytic reason, the network that evolved to help us manipulate the material world, sees a, chain, sees a world that is dead and inert, easy to quantify and determined by a causal chain. Empathic reason, on the other hand, the network that has evolved to help us understand ourselves and others, sees a world that is alive and full of meaning and purpose including consciousness, free will, and the value in people. Both of these views of the world do manage to reflect rich, rich, rich aspects of reality, of course. How else would we so successfully create new technologies and navigate our social worlds? But they are also constructions that our brain hallucinates to make sense of different aspects of the world. As an aside, if you don't believe that the notion of a cause is a mental construct, you should read the great Scottish philosopher and one of the founders of empiricism, David Hume, or just talk to an actual physicist. Physicists don't speak of causes. Physics aims at universal laws, but comes up with ones that aren't quite universal and which can't quite integrate with each other. Our naive idea of science is often a long way from how profound scientific thinkers understand it. But here is the problem, and the reason I felt the need to make that aside. Analytic reason has come to culturally dominate, to such an extent that we have come to believe that one of these worlds is real and the other an illusion. Science and technology have been so visibly successful and have come to dominate our lives to such an extent that we have occluded the other pole of reason. For instance, only a century ago, many philosophers were idealists, that is, they believe that the ultimate nature of reality is consciousness. Now materialism rules, and many philosophers are skeptical there's even a genuine problem of consciousness. One reason that's a problem is this. Network neuroscience shows us that empathic reason actually lies at the core of the brain. The empathic network is the central hub. Mark Rakel, the neuroscientist who has done some of the most influential work on this brain network, describes it as being like the conductor of the symphony of the brain. Here is another striking observation. Brain imaging of ex-coma patients who are somewhere on the spectrum from locked-in syndrome through minimally conscious state to the vegetative state 
shows that the function of the empathic network, along with its tendency to oscillate with the analytic network, is what best predicts the patient's level of consciousness. In other words, the science shows that it's the empathic network that really matters. It is the network that drives your consciousness. It regulates your body, your emotions, and your motivations. It makes the decisions that are practically important and allows you to connect to your family and friends. It is responsible for your sense of self and your sense of purpose in life. It might even help you connect to your colleagues, incidentally. Yet, how much effort do we put into training the empathic network? Very little. The vast majority of our pedagogic efforts are put into training the analytic network. We like to emphasize STEM in education, yet STEM are just the types of thinking that cause the empathic network to toggle off. Not that it is bad to let our empathic network rest. There's every reason to suppose that's an important thing to do. But our current education system and the screens and smartphones that constantly grab our attention, they don't just let it rest. They encourage it to atrophy. It didn't used to be like this. When the notion of the academy was born in ancient Greece, the primary focus was on how to live a good life. At that time, philosophy was essentially the only discipline and contained all others. A very healthy organization, I think. Um, yet philosophy was not seen as a purely intellectual exercise. Philosophy was a way of life. A way of life dedicated to reason, yes. Yet much, perhaps the majority of that reason was practical not theoretical. In Plato, for instance, it's, it's, his writings exclusively take the form of dialogues between interlocutors, not some abstract analytic thesis. The ancient Greeks frame much of their philosophy as being about leadership and how to be virtuous. The Stoic philosophers then took this teaching out of the rarefied academy, moving it to the porches, or stoa, as they were called. Their primary goal was to train all citizens to use empathic reason to help regulate their emotions and realize their human nature. And the Stoics recognized that our human nature was highly social. By contrast, we emphasize STEM. Is it really a coincidence that we're now suffering from a crisis of social disconnection in the West? Empathy rates have plummeted over the last few decades and loneliness has skyrocketed. Because we are such social creatures, this is extraordinarily bad for our well-being, not just for our psychological st stability and happiness, but also for our physical well-being, for our very mortality. Social disconnection exacerbates stress and inflammatory responses, and as a result is now the largest single cause of mortality in the United States. It is, I contend, an accident of intellectual history that we have come to prioritize science to such a great extent over the arts and humanities. An accident that is tearing us apart as individuals and as a society. I believe this accident is the result of an accumulation of errors that result from what may have been initially just a slight bias in our thinking. We have come to privilege analytic reason over empathic reason in a way that has ultimately given us a deeply distorted picture of reality. The central concept I have for you here is analytic misconstrual. So bear with me, I'll explain it, and if you, if you keep thinking about it, you'll see it everywhere, I can assure you. Analytic misconstrual is when we use analytic reason to try to understand something that's better understood through empathic reason. Yet, instead of recognizing that we only have a partial picture, we assume analytic reason gives us a complete understanding of the phenomenon. To be clear, the problem is not in analytic misconstrual that one tries out using a different way of reasoning um, to, for something that is usually understood in another way. That's actually often a useful thing to do. For example, as a shorthand, we may often employ the empathic lens. For instance, we may say our computer is trying to print, or we may speak of evolution as designing us to be a certain way, or of genes as being selfish. Yet hopefully we ultimately understand that neither computers nor genes have intentions and nothing actually involved for a purpose. It was just a chain of events shaped by natural selection. As another example, it may be useful to think of collectives of people, including corporations, as having intentions and perhaps even rights. Although one should be aware that in doing so, 
and it might be in danger of stretching the lens too far. Similarly, we can use the analytic lens to engage in some useful, if sometimes perhaps over-glorified, analyses of matters that can only truly be understood through an empathic lens. If you're a management scientist or consultant, you may find it useful to think of people as human resources to help you decide how to best allocate an organization's assets. If you're an economist, you may think of people as units of economic production or human capital. If you're an academic administrator, you might find it useful to think about the output of your faculty in terms of citation metrics. All these examples illustrate how extraordinarily creative we have become in applying the lenses of analytic and empathic reason to phenomena which are usually or predominantly understood through the other lens. Provided these applications of, of lenses are understood to only offer a partial and somewhat distorted view, they aren't what I would call misconstrual. Misconstrual is when you think or you try to claim you have the whole picture even though you aren't looking through the best suited lens. Perhaps most importantly, it is when you insist on making decisions based on a one-sided unnatural view of the situation, brushing aside objections that you have missed the point. So what is a good example of analytic misconstrual? Let me start by giving you a more entertaining example. Is there anyone out there who still isn't clear about what doing drugs does? Okay, last time. This is your brain. This is drugs. This is your brain on drugs. Any questions? What is troubling here is not that there might not be some way to make the analogy work. Indeed, if we stretch, perhaps we might say there is a parallel between the coagulation of egg protein caused by heat and the way addiction can cause neurons in the nucleus accumbens to become overconnected. That in turn causes the relevant motivational circuitry to be resistant to top-down modulation from the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Or to put it another way, it makes the individual increasingly suffer from weakness of the will, such that the motivations that drive their actions become more and more resistant to practical reason. So we can play it out, we can find a way to play it out, but the problem with the advert is perhaps best, best exemplified by the utterly disingenuous rhetorical question at the end. Any questions? It is the idea that this highly reductive depiction of addiction is somehow a complete story, rather than a desperate and dishonest attempt to give false authority to Ronald Reagan's utterly ill-conceived social policy of a war on drugs. Let me give you another example of analytic misconstrual that you will see right through. How should we understand the Declaration of Independence assertion that it is a self-evident truth that all men are created equal? Well, one response would be to counter that this is quite clearly false, that people are created equal. Modern science has shown that people vary in all sorts of ways. Some people even some well-known leaders, are sociopaths who lack the motivation and capacity for ethical behavior. Further, we know this to be at least partially determined by genetics, so how can it possibly be claimed that people are created equal? The eugenicist would go a little further and attempt to prevent the creation of such individuals. However, this would of course be an analytic misconstrual of the declaration. The claim of equality is a moral claim, not an empirical claim. It's a claim that no person is, or ought to be thought of, created with greater intrinsic value or social superiority to another. The converse of this view is to dehumanize a group of people, to see them as lesser in value. My lab and a number of others have done studies showing that when we think of people as lesser in this way, when we objectify or dehumanize them, or we attempt to manipulate them, or to lie to them, or we emphasize disgust um, in our attitude towards them, then we shift our brain activity from the empathic to the analytic network. In other words, the analytic network interferes with our perception of humanity. <laughs>
Other examples of analytic misconstrual include the notion that a utilitarian ethics captures the es essence of morality. Indeed, it was this act of analytic misconstrual that Immanuel Kant responded to, causing him to author the single most famous alternative model of morality. Critically, Kant's objection was that theoretical reason could not possibly constitute an adequate basis for morality, but rather that it must be based in practical reason. Another act of analytic mis misconstrual is the idea that science can provide a full and adequate account of human consciousness. This idea is nicely captured by Francis Crick's claim in his book, The Astonishing Hypothesis, that thoughts and feelings are nothing but the activity of neurons. Again, the problem here is not that the idea that the analytic lens might shed some light on the situation. Thoughts and feelings do indeed arise from the activity of neurons, and looking at that activity is likely to be interesting and informative. The problem is with the nothing but. It's not so much an astonishing hypothesis as an arrogant hypothesis. The assumption here is that the analytic lens is exhaustive. But obviously it isn't. It only allows us to see one aspect of reality, and in doing so, it occludes in our very physiology. It occludes us from taking the perspective that evolution designed for us to understand other minds. If you want to understand someone else's perspective, then clearly the reductive scientific lens isn't going to be very useful. You need a hermeneutic or interpretive lens. Similarly, the idea that people's actions are entirely determined and that free will does not exist overestimates the power of science and fails to recognize that our perspective on each other is not some objective view from nowhere, but rather a connected participant attitude, or at least it ought to be. As long as we're in contact with each other, there is no hope of an analytic solution to understanding each other's actions. There's not even an analytic solution to the very simple problem of three objects that interact as governed by a single force, the famous three-body problem, let alone when the forces that govern our interactions are as complex as human understanding. We are likely to do better influencing each other in a helpful way if we focus on our humanity and on that basis attempt to gauge in dialogue and reason with each other, an attitude that is fundamentally incompatible with viewing each other as determined objects suitable for manipulation. The physicist Tanner Edis is both a proclaimed atheist and an apologist for scientism. He writes, it is defensible to claim that scientific, philosophical, and humanistic forms of knowledge are continuous, and that a broadly naturalistic description of our world centered on natural science is correct. At the very least, such views are legitimate. They may be mistaken, but not because of an elementary error, a confusion of science with ideology, or an offhand dismissal of the humanities. Those of us who argue for such a view are entitled to have two cheers for an ambitious concept of science. And if that is scientism, so be it. Tanner Edis is right. Scientism and the notion that all forms of human knowledge are continuous is not an incoherent idea, a foolish idea, or even necessarily an ideological idea. And as he is also right, that that idea might be wrong. Indeed, we have every reason to suppose it's wrong, other than maybe a preference for more ambitious ideas. Ideology is the only reason to believe it's right. Scientism has long been critiqued in the humanities, as well as the more humanistic branches of the social sciences. Think, for instance, of Max Weber. The difference is that now that science can peer into the organ of knowledge, Science itself strongly suggests that scientism is wrong. Science has revealed its own limits. There is no single tree of human knowledge. Our understanding of the world has at least two quite distinct foundations. Putting a scientific worldview as the central trunk of human knowledge condemns the most valuable and vital forms of knowledge and wisdom to wither. That is, it will cause our ability to be in contact with each other and reason with each other to wither. Universities teach all sorts of things. Science, medicine, law, engineering, communication skills. 
Skills that allow our graduates to change the world. For our graduates, acquiring these skills increases their opportunities, economic and otherwise. At least potentially, everyone benefits. There is a powerful utilitarian argument for the value of the university. And that's all good. That certainly matters. Succeedings at such things should wrap up us in the rankings. But it isn't everything that matters, and it certainly isn't what matters most. To allow that perspective to dominate, as both anxious parents and anxious administrators are wont to do, is to miss the point. The purpose of the university cannot just be to increase the earning potential of graduates by training them to more effectively manipulate the world. If that is our essence, we aren't a university at all. We might as well be Trump University. The university's central role in society is to help tie it together, to act as a beacon helping us to recreate social harmony and order in changing circumstances. To do that, first and foremost, we need to help connect people to a shared sense of purpose. Achieving that in this complex and technologically transformed world is clearly no simple task. It certainly requires highly developed reason. But the central tool we're going to use to accomplish this most fundamental and necessary goal is not not analytic reason. It is the type of reason that is capable of understanding the perspectives of a very diverse population. It is the type of reason that can help us craft narratives that are both fundamentally humane and which can be made simple enough that they will resonate with those who don't have the privilege of our level of education. The university that fails to prioritize the arts and humanities as the central and guiding core of its intellectual and educational activities is the university that has given in and given up on democracy. Like Phineas Gage, the university and its graduates may still demonstrate technical intelligence, but their behavior will, be, will become increasingly sociopathic and their future prospects will be dim. We can be confident of this conclusion, not because some liberal humanities professor makes the claim on the basis of their potentially biased interpretation of the history of ideas. Or rather, actually, that is one good reason, but there's also more. We can be confident of it because the science tells us that this massive swath of highly plastic and malleable cortex is the key to our well-being, both as individuals and as a society. This endows us with a type of reason that lies at the opposite pole from the type of reason we have come to glorify, the sort of systematic and reductionist thinking that has allowed us to manipulate and transform the natural world around us. How we think transforms the world. This is your brain on humanity. We neglect to educate it at our peril. Okay, I got some questions. Why can we not learn to see both the duck and the rabbit? Now, I could interpret this as a literal question about perception. And it just happens to be a way in which the visual system is very wisely set up to pick a winner um, so that um, you can actually make decisions about what you're going to do. Um, and of course, the duck rabbit is, um, is a very, I mean, there are very few figures like this and none that go three ways that, I, that I've been able to find anyway, um, and it, apart from maybe some geomet geometrical ones can, but no rich ones. Um, so it is quite hard to craft a figure that is that ambiguous. Um, and I, you know, I, I have done some research in visual science, but I'm, I'm not an expert. I couldn't give you a, a very good explanation of exactly why we can't learn to see both in the duck and the rabbit. It's just how the system is set up, set up to pick a winner. Why can't we be both empathic and analytic at the same time is maybe one of the most common questions that's asked to me. People have this dream that they, oh no, well I can do that or something like that. Um, Look, for one thing, you should realize that we can integrate analytic and empathic knowledge. Um, we can toggle between the two. We can look at situations from different perspectives. And while they may be somewhat incommensurable perspectives, we can triangulate with them. And that is how I would suggest you really come up with a good solution to any complex system. Now, you can learn to think both analytically and empathically um, a bit more at the same time. And there's some evidence that's linked to creativity, but you better be careful because it's also 
you know, going to predict that you become schizophrenic. So it creates an instability in the brain. The two, the two ways of thinking tend to interfere with each other. So um, it's not necessarily a smart thing. I mean, do you want to hop everywhere? No, I think you want to walk on your left foot, then your right foot. Do you want to breathe in and out at the same time? No, these are ridiculous ideas, right? The system is set up a particular way. Uh, evolution designed it a particular way. And uh, I think we do well to um, respect that. Okay, next question. You spoke of training the empathic network. What might that look like in late 2020? Um, yeah, boy, we got to get be quick. Well, I'm teaching a science of happiness course in early 2021. So um, I actually think there is lots of wisdom about how we can train the empathic network better. And obviously, it involves the arts and the humanities. Um, the arts and the humanities, or the, the arts in general, they stir up emotions in us, and they encourage us to contemplate them. Much like doing mathematical problems, um, you know, in order to learn how to do math better, and maybe to be an engineer, we can, we can indeed learn to um, reason with our emotions better. I think one way in which sometimes the humanities go wrong is they just become too analytic. They become too technical and they try and people try and write grants that look like scientific grants. We should not be swayed by this paradigmatic idea that knowledge should conform to this kind of scientific model. Um, Jerome Bruner was a, he was a great um, psychologist, quite influential within education. And he talked about paradigmatic mode of thought versus narrative mode of thought. And part of his point was, of course, to, to point out the importance of a narrative mode of thought. Well, social narrative and creating narratives that, that guide us and that enable us to understand other people is a, is a large part of what you could understand the empathic network to be doing. Um, so I think, I think what we could do is we could do a lot more to integrate all the stuff that we know from, well, all the way from the Stoics to through to modern psychology and positive psychology with our arts and humanities. And um, I think that integration is the key point that we're missing. Um, but I think, I think we do do a lot of it. It's just people don't realize how important some of the things we have available are. Um, okay, how does the Liberal Arts College of the Future usefully strike a balance between humanities and STEM so as to promote the systems of thought you discussed? Um, yeah, I mean, I think one of the biggest challenge is to actually convince um, people that, 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 and particularly the incoming students, that the humanities are really going to be useful to their education, and in fact are really an essential part of their education. Um, most, most people are right-handed or left-handed. They have a preference, right, for one hand or the other. And, um, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Right, but you don't really want one arm to become a lot stronger than the other, just like you don't want one leg to become a lot stronger than the other. So I think even if you have um, a preference for one thinking style, and that's that's what's going to work best for you, um, you still want some balance. So I think it's it's adding an emphasis for more balance instead of people feeling like they ought to focus just on one side. People appreciating the importance of balance. Um, and, and increasing the accessibility of our arts and humanities courses, I think, is very important. Okay, um, I'm, I'm told that's it, question-wise. I think that's a little unimaginative of you out there, but, you know, I'll work with it. Um, been, it's been fun. Bye.